to the PG Sets festive finale. My name is LaShawn and I will be hosting for you today. Um, I started my employment with Causeway through the Kickstart scheme, can you believe? And I'm here today hosting. Um, so that's some growth on my end and please be easy on me. <laughs> um, learning about the and seeing the improvements in this sector has been eye-opening for myself and while working at Causeway, we're always keen on seeing and absorbing new ideas to help students overcome barriers. Um, I'm excited to hear the discussions from our guests today and it's great to see some familiar faces as well. Um, as you already know, we're supporting the launch of the Level 7 Postgraduate Certificate in Access, Outreach and Social Mobility, and we'll be hearing a bit more in, of an in-depth update later, so um, I won't give you all the details now, um, but I do ask that everyone please mute their mics, um, just to limit some background noise. If you do have any questions or if you're having some technical difficulties, please just place your questions or your queries in the chat function, and myself or Matt, who's our technical support, will help you. Um, we will have some audience participation, so don't worry, you won't just be sitting behind your screens board today. Um, and lastly, the session is being recorded, so if you're feeling like a movie star, this is your movie, but if you're not too keen on being in the recording, you can turn your camera off. Okay, so we're going to jump straight into it. I'm going to introduce our four lovely judges. Um, they will also be speaking on their ideas, their favourite ideas, and giving you a bit of a um, idea into why they enjoyed it, why they picked it, and any other um, reasons as to why it stood out. Firstly, we'll have Michael Englard, who is a registrar at the London Interdisciplinary School, and he's also a Causeway trustee. So I'll pass on to you, Michael. Thanks so much, uh, LaShawn. Would you like me to uh, introduce myself or talk about the idea? Yes, please, you can give us more intro and you can um, go ahead and give your ideas. Great, yes, so thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm a, a trustee of, of Causeway and, and set it up, um, I think it might have been six or seven years ago um, with Sam, uh, and uh, now just started a new university called the, the London Interdisciplinary School. Uh, and I will just give you a quick rundown of the idea that I chose. I particularly liked uh, Michael Slavinsky's idea, uh, and I will, I'll go verbatim. So he says, wouldn't it be great if schools and universities could organize a handover meeting for their most vulnerable students and first generation scholars to a quote unquote form tutor uh, in the widening participation team. And that person would help them navigate student finance, bursaries, finding accommodation, uh, and things like uh, e even email management. Uh, and the reason I really liked this idea, I sort of applied a little set of criteria as to whether the idea was timely, whether it was feasible, whether it would connect different stakeholders in the space and whether it could have the potential to drive better outcomes for students. And I think this idea succeeds on all fronts. Uh, I think it's timely, obviously, because of the, the huge disruption uh, caused by COVID and the pressure it's put on student transitions. Uh, it's very kind of of the moment uh, question at the moment uh, with the regulators like the Office of Students, really thinking about how good transitions to university and higher education uh, could lead to better retention uh, and even graduate outcomes for students. So I think it's very much kind of of the moment. Uh, the next criteria I thought about was, is this idea feasible? And I think this is, it's, it's actually, actually been really quite tough to arrange all of these meetings between uh, admissions or widening participation teams at, at universities and uh, schools. And obviously this will be a kind of difficult moment in the year, uh, probably quite late, I would imagine, maybe it might be early September or even sort of uh, late August. So I think it's, it's tough to do, but I think it's possible. Uh, I think it's also important to note that obviously not all students, not all vulnerable students are uh, 18 years old. Uh, and so many might not have uh, the equivalent of a, a sort of form tutor who could do this kind of handover. Uh, but I, I still feel this is it's a feasible idea and it's a kind of an operational change, which doesn't require a huge kind of policy machinery to make it work. Um, my third criteria was, does it connect stakeholders in the space? Uh, and this is where I, I feel that the idea really succeeds because 
it has the potential to really improve relationships between schools and colleges uh, and universities to both improve information flows, but also improve personal relationships and connections. I feel there could be a lot of really strong ripple effects just by starting off with this kind of one set of targeted meetings. Uh, and the final criteria was, does this have the potential to drive better outcomes for students? Uh, and, and here I feel it really succeeds very, very strongly. I think it could significantly improve the experience of the transition for students, could take away a lot of those difficult sort of friction points uh, and just sort of introduction, familiarization with uh, the tools that you need to, to navigate uh, university life. So I thought this was a great idea. Um, well done, Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so we have our second judge, who is Tanya Maraha, and she is the founder of Championing Youth Minds. Um, so Tanya, if you'd like to give a bit of an introduction and your idea as well. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sean. So I'm the founder of Championing Youth Minds. We are a youth-led um, mental health nonprofit organisation. So we empower young people to support other young people to care for their mental well-being, and we do this through free workshops and online social media content. And the idea which stood out to me the most was Claire Rodden's idea. And I'll just read out what um, she submitted. Um, the idea is one website, either an outpost of UCAS or a separate discrete organization where students can search and apply for apprenticeships and degree apprenticeships in one place, ideally with one application form and style for all. Um, and for me, this really stood out because I remember my time kind of just before like the UCAS applications and there wasn't really any information about apprenticeships um, and if you wanted information about it you had to kind of go and approach someone in the career service and I think this type of idea would really allow for an integration of students who are looking to maybe take a different path but having that normalization of um, you know the path that they want to take is valid um, and I think it would also increase the amount of students kind of exploring the idea of apprenticeships had I maybe had a website where I could have um, searched and saw everything in one place, maybe that would have helped me decide if I actually wanted to do a degree or I wanted to do an apprenticeship instead. And lastly, um, Essex Council actually did um, a study recently about the kind of practical skills and learnings with apprenticeships and they found that apprenticeships um, in some ways do actually prepare young people for work in better ways than kind of the learning methods on a degree. So I feel like now that we're moving kind of um, towards like more research about this, that apprenticeships are definitely of more interest and this idea would definitely help um, bridge the gap for young people and really learning about apprenticeships. Thank you so much, Tanya, for your um, description, your idea choice. Um, so thirdly, we have Sherelle David, who is a PhD student at the Department of Sociology at LSE. Um, so I'll pass it to Sherelle to give your introduction and your idea. Thanks, Sean. So as just mentioned, I am a third year PhD student, um, previously a Causeway employee, actually still an um, application mentor. Um, uh, my, my research is based around um, hate, how, race and how race and ethnicity is understood um, within WP, so from all the way from national policy level to WP practitioners and sort of the ideas of race and ethnicity that are embedded into um, our delivery and the programmes that we design. Um, so before I say the idea which I uh, like the best, um, just to put into context, so um, one thing I'm doing as well as this PhD is teaching a second year course on social theory. Um, and one of the things we've been looking at and thinking through is this idea of post-colonial theory um, and thinking through the idea of the colonizing universities. And I'm sure everyone sort of heard that phrase, the colonized universities. Um, and for me, I have been thinking through sort of what that means for widening participation and how the colonizing universities and WP meet. Um, and I, I, I can't, we have, to have two minutes, I'm not going to completely explain what decolonizing is, um, but I think the thing I take from it most is that we really need to begin sort of radically reimagining what H HE institutions are and what they're for. And for me, um, Duncan Hexley's idea really spoke to this. So if I comment a bit more, I just want to read out um, his idea. 
So Duncan said he would send every school leaver to university so that vocational courses are taught in the same institutions as academic ones. Um, and this would reduce the tendency of policymakers to neglect vocational education. It would allow HE providers to give students a mix of vocational and academic skills um, that real life, that in real life jobs require. Um, it will bring a wider mixture of people into higher education institutions, helping demystify such places. So um, non-traditional non students feel more confident in applying and more at home when they arrive, and it will help tackle um, career snobbery. So just to go back to sort of how this fits in with sort of how I'm thinking through WP and sort of the colonising institutions at the moment. Um, again, so much resources out there in terms of what that means. But for me, um, a fundamental part of the colonising institutions is um, understanding, acknowledging sort of historically how institutions are were essentially for British elites and sort of how they were also fundamental in British colonial projects. Um, and I think when we think of this, often we think of perhaps racial inequality institutions and promoting racial equality. But for me, this is a fundamental part of the colonising is understanding how um, the ex exclusion of working class students in particular have been built into these institutions. And of course, I'm particularly thinking of more elite institutions, the Rasa groups, Oxford, et cetera. Um, and again, I just wanted to read sort of a quote I found from the LSE um, the Colonization Collective. Um, and they say, we understand the colonization in, in, in institutes of higher education to be about both changing how we understand, study and act in the world and two, empowering diverse people and valuing diverse forms of knowledge and experience. Um, and to bring us back to Duncan's idea, I think he really goes some way to challenging the elitism that is embedded in the universities in our country. Um, and it challenges what universities are for, who they are for, and what awards are achieved in them. And I'll round off by saying, I remember when I first came into the sector, hearing this idea a lot of like, in the WP sector, we are here to do ourselves out of a job. Um, and fundamentally, we don't want to exist in the end. Um, and I don't know to what extent that can happen within sort of the structures of HE we have, we have at the moment. Um, and I think Duncan's idea for me connects widening participation to sort of broader movements that are happening within institutions. Um, and I think it goes some way to that idea of doing ourselves out of a job and moving WP from being um, an intervention to actually restructuring the way institutions are. And that is why Duncan's is my favourite. Thank you very much, Cheryl. That was a very deeply thought through description <laughs> or explanation. Um, lastly, we have Catherine Pride, who's our last judge. She is director of the credit team and the social mobility lead at Dartmouth Partners. Um, Catherine, you can take it away. Hi there. So just a brief introduction. So um, I'm, I'm a recruiter, basically, um, and the firm that I work for um, focuses on recruiting people into specialist um, careers at an experience level, but we also have an early careers team that runs uh, graduate, intern, and now school leaver recruitment for um, quite a lot of um, clients, predominantly in London, but also in New York. Um, and uh, as LaShawn said, I have a particular focus on social mobility, but our firm as a whole is very interested in addressing um, the desire of many of our clients to become more diverse and more inclusive. Um, and so part of my role is to, to help advise them on embedding that into their recruitment practices. Um, and uh, well, actually, what's been really interesting about um, my job is seeing people across different countries and how um, uh, it works outside of the UK um, and or, or doesn't work. Um, uh, but, but for that reason, the idea that stood out to me was Ed Penn's. So I'll, I'll read I'll, I'll read it. I won't paraphrase it because it's extremely well written. Um, Meritocratic admissions models at highly selective universities are at best flawed and at worst a barely qualified failure. Um, it is empirically demonstrable that grades achieved in public exams do not represent talent or ability in the clear cut or objective way in which they are presented to. I propose a regulatory requirement for selective universities to offer a foundation year funded jointly by institutions and government to prepare applicants who would not normally meet the grade profile required by the university due to contextual factors. Entry to a standard course upon completion of the FY should be guaranteed and teaching should be administered in specialised by specialised teaching staff who follow bespoke programme mapping 
A-level content onto undergraduate study and highlighting the differences between modes of working and ways of thinking at Key Stage 5 and the undergraduate level. Um, so the reason that this stood out to me was that it feels like a very sort of transformative and, and ambitious idea, um, which I just like in general. Um, and, and I think, you know, sort of a, a bit of a shake up of this sector is, is quite desirable. Um, clearly agree that grades are not a transparent reflection of potential. Um, and you see that in the working world all the time. Um, so it, it, it's often very hard for employers to get around this idea that they need to have seen somebody be academically successful in the past. Um, but, but when you do see people break through who have had, um, uh, who haven't had three A's at A level, um, it, it is other characteristics and things about them that help them do well in the workplace. Um, and, and, you know, clearly yeah, anything that's exam based and, and graded is a representation of how that person did on the day in any case, um, not necessarily any kind of long term indicator of success. Um, I think also uh, th there's a lot of talk about creating contextual models um, to help um, sort of a, a adjust entry requirements for some of these university courses and the need for um, re recruitment processes. Um, but, but what's quite challenging is that, that there is no um, single measure and, and still not really like a, a bunch of measures that can come together to help use that model accurately um, or necessarily fairly, more fairly than, than things currently stand as they are. Um, but there is some kind of evidence, I guess, out there that this sort of approach could work. So um, th this sort of uh, year um, of preparing exists in other forms in different countries. So. Um, they have this in the US, um, they've got something comparable in Ireland, um, but, but I think it probably works best in France. Um, and we see um, uh, family background being far less of an issue for the, the French candidates that we see coming through. And interestingly, they are often more diverse as well um, across other metrics. Um, and so we see in France where people have to do this preparation year before going to an elite university, um, it's um, it's really helpful in, in sort of levelling playing field and also getting people up to speed socially with how university works. So um, that was my my favourite idea. Thank you very much, Catherine. And thank you to all our judges for their feedback on their favourite ideas. It was very insightful. You can see a difference in why you've chosen them. So thank you very much. Uh, so next on our agenda, we will have a small section of our a small selection of our entrants that will be talking about their own ideas um, and then we'll have a Q&A section. So for our Q&A section, I would just like if you have any questions that you want to put forward, if you could just drop them in our chat so that we're prepared to ask them with a good time. But firstly, we will hear from our two entrants that will be speaking on their ideas. So I will pass over to Helena Vine, who is the Policy and Public Affairs Officer and at Impetrus PEF. She will be speaking on her idea. So Helena, I will pass over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, so my idea actually touched on a lot of the things that have been said, but um, our idea was to have a much bigger focus on level two qualifications. If we want to get serious about really expanding the numbers, who can make it into higher education. So that's GCSE and equivalents. And kind of instead of thinking about the transition to university, kind of spring from like your level three qualifications or your A-levels into university, actually starting when you're kind of getting your GCSE qualifications at level two. Um, this is because there's about 75,000 young um, people who are free school meal eligible um, in each year group. And this is the group kind of the impetus care about. But when you go to level three, that shrinks by two thirds. So only 25,000 young people are then actually making the transition successfully to level three and then able to kind of go on to higher education. And whilst we've got really inventive about university admissions, we've kind of heard some of those ideas as well. Why not apply those principles to the transition to level three and treat this as a really crucial transition point and kind of a journey towards higher education? And so treating preparation for level three or your A levels or your BTECs with kind of the same rigorous approach that we do for higher education. So more attainment raising support, more exposure to the options and the environment of level three qualifications, especially for young people where that will be taking place in a different environment or on a different site and it's not attached to their secondary school. And um, building those trusted relationships across the two stages, so within their secondary school and within their sixth form college or FE college. Um, and thinking a bit more creatively about admissions criteria. So 
Catherine's talked a lot about contextual admissions, and this is getting more and more popular at universities. But if we don't think A-levels indicate the full potential of a student, then why should GCSEs be indicating that full potential when they go on to A-levels? So why not have contextual admissions for how you go on to your A-levels? Um, and also, preschool and eligible students, less than half of them are getting a pass grade in their English and Maths, and this holds a lot of them back. And we're fully able to fully in support of helping them reset them and get those level two qualifications. But they shouldn't be holding them back from studying other subjects where they have kind of got those grades and that, that they do want to pursue. So having a really clear path for young people who haven't got their math, English and Maths, but can reset them alongside continuing to level three in the, in the qualifications where they have got the grades and they do want to pursue them. And so really treating this kind of level two to level three is the pivotal transition for most young people from disadvantaged backgrounds in their journey to higher education and getting a lot more creative about supporting them into that transition. Okay, thank you very much, Helena. Um, that was very insightful. So we'll have our second entrant who will also be speaking on the idea. And we have Helen Drummond, who is the program director of Christmas East at LA Tottenham. She will be speaking on her idea. So take it away, Helen. Thanks for having me speak, first of all. Um, the one thing I was going to say, this is so inspiring. I, I forget how nice it is to just come and talk about ideas. And also um, a good segue is to say that the um, I once hosted a session like this and it with, with WP practitioners and the idea of a qualification for WP was one of the things that we came up with and obviously that's why we're here today so like it's not I just I think it's important to mention these are all these are ideas that we will see I'm absolutely sure um, in practice at, at some point. I also um, heartily recommend you vote for Helen's idea because um, I work at a sixth form called the London Academy of Excellence in Tottenham and I am in charge of our outreach programme. So we actually have our own outreach programme donor funded. That, and so we work from primary all the way up with young people to make sure they can get into sixth form. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that is definitely... Um, it feels like a really effective way of working with a lot of students in a lot more in, in intense way. So my vote gets for Helena. Um, the other thing that we're doing is attainment raising. And I've already had a couple of calls and anybody who works with people will chuckle at this about, um, oh, what are you doing for attainment raising? What's working there? Which is, um, I'm assuming that that's the next big idea. And that is going to be, um, that, that's the sort of the levelling up idea now is that universities can be doing attainment raising um, in school. So we'll see how that goes. But... Let's uh, talk about attainment, though, because that's what I want. That's what I'm interested in. I'm assuming, based on everything that we've heard and that you're here in this room, that you accept that the fact that attainment is linked to family income and your parents' professions. And I think if we can, if we do accept that as a truth, yet we're still asking for our outreach programmes to have entrant requirement grades on them, that we're, we're going to come against a problem all the time. So I want to read a couple of um, things to you that when I was thinking about this idea that, that, um, that sort of inspired me. This is a very big, famous universities um, outreach programme, and they are looking for schools, state schools, who can evidence the following characteristics. A, high, a record of high achieving students, students with above national average percentage of receipt of free school meals, schools with above national average percentage of students who live in Polar 4 and um, or and or IMD quintiles 1 and 2, schools with low progression of, of rates to Oxbridge and low progression to top third universities. I don't know how many schools are able to combine those two things at the same time. And, and this is where schools, I think, get a bit like, it's really hard for them to engage with those universities when these criteria become so tight. Let me read another extract to you from another uh, summer school programme. Um, now, this one is, is not a free programme. You pay for this programme. It's 10 days. There's different careers you can choose from. Uh, and it costs about £3,000 in total. Um, do I need to apply and be accepted to join this programme? There is no application required to attend our programmes, as we feel that passion, ambition and a willingness to commit to your future is enough. Um, and I just thought, isn't it? bonkers that the sector that's supposed to be providing a, a really high quality opportunities for young people to engage with HE have this kind of wall up against it and actually if I can afford to pay doesn't matter what I can just be passionate and ambitious and I really think that we have to start thinking much more carefully about the grade requirements that we're going to put um, on on summer schools before we um 
support any of our outreach activities but fundamentally what schools want is a is access to high quality HE encounters we're supposed to be providing those but sometimes it's really hard for us to find the right students that suit this very narrow selection criteria um, and I want to give you um, yeah, I guess a couple of examples. Well, firstly, to say that if you know me really well, you'll have heard me pitch the idea for a mediocre summer school. And you might be thinking, is this that? And it kind of, it isn't, but it's a kind of more grown up version of saying there are just lots of students that actually need access to outreach and WP. They need to be in universities and it's really hard for schools to, to do that for a lot of the reasons that all of us today have talked about. Um, uh, but also to demonstrate, um, uh, well a couple of points one is that um so i do well my program does attainment raising i'll put it in inverted commas because i actually don't know that it, we can prove that we've raised attainment yet and anyone who works in that sector will know that is also very hard to do but we've, we're trying and because our, our sixth form is um actively selective you have to get a grade seven in at least five GCSEs to get in so we do work with students at grade seven to nine and they come into our school because we know that they will probably turn up they are those students that are going to be motivated and that really would like to be part of our, of our organization so we have them come and that's just one group we then also um, work with students at grade five to six but we go into school because actually if we're really serious about having underrepresented student groups in our school we need to go and find those students and that's not probably going to be in, in grade seven to nine, um, but we will find them in their school at five to six. We also then have a separate, pro, separate piece of work with students at grade three to four GCSE predicted, because actually without that, without a grade five, their access to uni is going to be denied completely and their access to sixth form is denied completely. So maybe what I'm saying is not particularly scrap grades, if you're going to use them, you've got to then have steps up for everybody. You cannot just keep selecting these small groups of students. Um, I certainly feel that sometimes the work that we can do, and I was really keen that any work I did in school was not going to compound students that already felt like they weren't worthy because they couldn't even get onto the program to try and get into the sixth form. Like it just feels like there's so many barriers. Um, and then another example of how this then gets compounded is, um, so I've been looking at applications to our sixth form. Over a third of our applicants are from Black uh, African heritage. Um, only 3% of our students are from uh, Black Caribbean or Caribbean mixed heritage. Now in, in Haringey, that's not a surprise in Tottenham, but it does mean that um, I need to think really carefully about actually what, what, what programmes we're going to put on so that we can actually do something about that. So I got in touch with a charity that I'm actually a trustee of, just Black Heritage Venturing, to say I'd like to do something specifically for Caribbean students around confidence at year nine. Um, and she's asked, great, because actually, we don't have many Caribbean students on our programme. And the reason for that is, and I, we, I will speak to her about it, is because they obviously have a grade requirement to get onto her programme. And you end up almost compounding the issue that you kind of want, we want to support black students into top two universities, but then we kind of, because of the grade requirements, we've ended up kind of potentially making that situation like more compounded. I'm not sure, but I feel very much that grades um, as an entry requirement into these programmes are problematic and we need to examine that fully. And that was longer than two minutes, but thanks. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> it was a great in-depth um, description, don't worry, I loved it. <laughs> um, Victoria thought it was very passionate as well. Um, so what we'll do, we'll jump into our Q&A and we're going to leave the floor open for anyone to ask any questions as we haven't had any questions so far, but we will leave the floor open. If you do have a question, you are free to ask. Um, if you are, if your camera is off, you can pop it into the chat and we will try and decipher which questions we can ask, but the floor is open. Anybody can ask questions to anybody. We have about eight minutes with our Q&A. Do any of our judges actually have judges um, questions for each other? Well, I had a question for Helen's idea or just to more information. I, I, so is this across the board that um, programmes often ask for um, grade requirements or is this particular types of universities? So the ones which are, for example, high tariff, are they the ones that generally have these, boundary, um, these grade boundaries? 
thanks for testing that this idea out <laughs> uh well I mean I'm hoping that Michael Englund will stop in at some point because he might have know more but I think you're right there's obviously it is about um high tariff institutions do have um but actually it, and and even medium tariff ones will still put um entry criteria on their programs and I'm not saying that you know you can't run your great big flagship summer school and at year 12 and and have great requirements on but you then that cannot be your answer to widening participation you then have like what's your kind of what, what what comes out around that like how do you scaffold to that how do you ensure that you've got the right applicants um for it um and exactly michael what requirements do you have for your outreach and indeed your university Oh, thanks, Helen. Well, we, we've tried to implement a sort of grades blind approach. So actually, we're completely open and we, we, we uh, into every single candidate, which is so it's a huge amount of organisational resource um, to do it. But we think it sort of is, is worth it. Um, yeah, I, I think the um, so, so many interesting kind of big structural questions coming out. I'm, I'm just really interested in, in Duncan's idea, actually, which is probably the most uh, maybe radical of them all. Um, do, do, do you think the, the idea is feasible, Duncan? Duncan, you're still on mute. Uh, hello. Um, I, I mean, I was given a a brief of um, the sorts of ideas you might come up with in the pub. <laughs> you know, the, why can't we just do this thing? And, and that's really where I was going from. But I think quite often we are seeing situations where ideas which are possible are ones we decide are possible. In the last couple of years when we've had, um, when we've had COVID and we've had all sorts of policies brought in that would have been impossible to imagine a couple of years ago and quite often things are possible if people who are deemed electorally important want them um, and and quite often if people from disadvantaged backgrounds want those things then not so much so however one of the things that i often say when i'm working with the people i do training for or consultancy for in widening participation is that don't get into thinking that widening participation is about um, working with marginalised groups. For a lot of the time it is about reaching outside of a minority because actually the people who don't go to university are a majority and I think if we realise that and if we talk about that more and say this sort of thing isn't for a small minority of people who don't really matter, it's for the diverse majority of us, then we might start to be able to think, yes, we can. Okay, so we have a question here from Julian for Helen. So he's asked, with regard to Helen's idea for focusing on FSM students at GCSE, this would be a positive development. However, the research shows that they're already fallen behind by year five and six in primary school. Shouldn't we be intervening at an earlier age so that they don't have so far to go in terms of catching up with their better off, or with their better off period peers at age 16 when it's already too late for many? Maybe it's for that's Helena. Helena. I reckon that's Helena. Helena yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's one for me. Um, no, definitely. I think early intervention is mainly the kind of the crux of the argument that I was trying to make. I think the reason I made the point at level two is because you genuinely see a lot of students essentially fall out of the system or get really, really stalled in it in a way that you don't earlier because they're, I mean, we talk about mandatory education until 18, but the fact of the matter is for a lot of people, it is only until 16 and a lot of the support and the funding evaporates at the age of 16. And so it is a really, really key um, transition point it's one that we really focus on as an organization but I definitely don't mean that at the expense of earlier intervention I think that's just as important I guess the argument is to shunt start shunting support backwards because once you get to level three you're already kind of working with young people most of them do tend to go on to university and um, if they manage to make it to level three so moving that support much earlier I think we'll take one more question. If anybody, anybody else has any questions that's asked, we'll take one more question and we'll move on. If not, we can go straight over. 
to say on Julia's point though, um, I just I, I just really plug in my own stuff here, but I have just started some amazing primary work in outreach, uh, thinking about how do we, what is the best way of working with with primary children? And my favourite thing that we're doing, we're doing lots of things. My favourite current thing is the Junior Vets Club, which is. Um, a free after school club running collaboration with the uh, the RVC Royal Veterinary College and they come into a school for six weeks and students children in year five and six do um, each week it's like a different animal and anatomy and they do like a little practical activity to learn about animals and do the animal welfare which obviously in an in a city like area like Tottenham we don't produce that many vets um, so just thinking of really creative ways that we can work at, at five to six is so much fun so I urge universities to to, to do more of that because it's yeah it's lovely oh, lovely okay so what we'll do we'll close our Q&A section now thank you for everyone that did have questions oh we have another one coming in yeah we'll take we'll take this last question from Julian again um, Julia, Children's University is a great organisation that encourages learning and extracurricular learning at a young age. It is. Children's no, CU is great. And actually, University of Wolverhampton have, uh, 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 that's where I first learned about Children's University when I was just learning on this PG cert, actually, and then heard about that. So, yeah, it's on my list of people to kind of get in touch with. So, thanks for that reminder. Thank you very much, Julian, for your questions. Okay, so, oh, we have, a, we have another question. Okay, now the questions are coming in. <laughs> Guys, we have, to, we have to close. So we'll give you one more minute so we can answer your questions. I can see now you're on the ball. In terms of ideas, very radical, this one. What about some continuity in WP policies since we are really trying to change culture as evidence in a number of ideas discussed by the panel? I have been around long enough to have witnessed P4P, excellent challenge, aim higher, NNCO, NCOP, Uni Connect. Okay, so we'll move on now. Thank you everyone again. Um, we will now be voting for our choice our um, audience's choice for the best idea what we'll do if you can all go to slido.com um matt if it's possible if you can show the screen just so that everyone can see where they're going um if it's possible um we'll go on to slido.com we will also put the code in in the chat so you can use the code so you're on the correct poll the code is ff2021 but it will be in the chat so you can just copy and paste it straight in you will have four options to choose from um, it will give you about three or four minutes to vote for your favorite idea and wait for everyone to return so slido.com with the code ff2021 If you're having any technical difficulties, do let us know. We'll give everyone about two more minutes with your voting and we'll move on.
Okay, so I think that is everyone. Yeah, we are good to go. So now we'll be moving on to the meatiest part of our meeting today. Um, we are going to have an overall update on the postgraduate certificate from someone who's actually involved in the creation. She'll be giving you an overall update on what is going on. And I will pass on to Helen Jomen. And don't worry, the results from the um, poll will be coming later on. You haven't just taken your votes. The um, answers I will be um, voting select the winner will be announced later on. But for now, we'll pass on to Helen Jomen, who will be giving an overall update on the PG service. Yes, I will. Um, has anybody heard of the PG set? I this is the first event I've been to in this series, but you can just put your, you can just like wave and nod. Have you, have you everyone heard of it? Okay, fab. Is anybody applying for it? Just out of interest on this. Brilliant, amazing. Okay, there's loads of it I can't see, but I'm assuming that they were saying yes too. Um, so uh, let me just get my notes out because Sam actually told me and we had a meeting yesterday about this, but really, really excitingly, so as I said at the, at the beginning of when I had my pitch, this was an idea that came out of um, a discussion just like this, that we needed a, a kind of qualification for those people who are really serious about um, wine participation, but also because as Neil has pointed out, this is not, these are not new issues, this is just, this has been rolling on for a while and actually um, the sector tends to get a lot of new people coming in and and having to sort of rediscover the same things that you you know a lot of us learned at the, at the beginning and it feels like that's the way that um wp has perhaps been working um so just to encourage you if you are interested in this sector or you have a team that you think might be um the program launches in um january it's a pilot in january with the full program at uh, the sort of the the the, the not practice one uh, in September. Um, so you can apply for both of those um, now. And in fact, people are, which is really exciting. Um, so it's a level seven qualification. So postgraduate certificate is a third of an MA effectively. So you could use this as credits towards a, um, a master's or as a standalone um, uh, qualification. But it's just so fun chatting to the university about this and about the theory the amazing theory that they can provide and then thinking about the sort of practical applications of that um, so I'm hoping it'll be a really useful qualification but also a really thoughtful one um, and the aim is um, eventually that actually we have people from across different sectors so if you work in CSR for example uh, as a corporate or if you work in a school doing this sort of role um, or if you're at a university, that we can all be on a programme like this and actually co-create and learn from each other. And I think that is exactly um, what the sector needs. Uh, you will get information sent to you after uh, this session. Have I missed anything, LaShawn or Sam, who's actually here now, who <laughs> I'm covering perfect. for? Excellent. <laughs> Made it. But yeah, no, that was great, Helen. Um, so yeah, sign-ups are open. But like Helen said, the information's coming out again. You probably had it already, but we will send it around again. But it's now live, so do get signed up. We can't wait to welcome you to Wolverhampton for the uh, the kickoff at the end of January. Oh, LeJean's on mute. Computers. <laughs> Thank you, Helen and Sam, um, for the overall update with that. Um, I can't wait to receive my own information. Um, <laughs> what we'll do now, we will be revealing the winner. Um, this is the nerve wracking part. So what we're gonna do, we're going to um, give you first the first, the third place and the second place. And then I'll like a drum roll for the first place. <laughs> so in the third place, it was actually very close. It was, send the idea to send every school leaver to university so that vocational courses are taught in the same institution as academic ones in second place it was regulatory requirement for all universities to offer a foundation year in order to prepare applicants who would not normally meet the grade profile due to contextual factors and in first place drum roll please <laughs> a university form tutor in the WP team who would check in on vulnerable first gen students during their first year after a handover meeting with the student school. So congratulations to number one. Yes, congratulations to the winner. 
thank you to everyone that put in or submitted their ideas. Um, all the ideas I've heard so far sound amazing. Um, for me, they're all winners, but you know, we can only take one. <laughs> so well done, congratulations. And we will be sending over a prize in honor of your achievement. So don't worry, um, you will get a little something for your participation. So finally, we will have a word from our judges. They will actually give their verdict and their thoughts on the audience choice winner. I'm sure it'll be brief, but they will give their um, thoughts and ideas as well. So what I would do, I'll actually start with Catherine, um, if you can give your thoughts on the winner. Yeah, I think it's a really great idea. I mean, I think anyone turning up at university, actually, regardless of background, can suddenly think what is going on here, it's so different. But then if, if you haven't had somebody preparing you for that experience, it's, uh, it's you know, clearly much more daunting. So, yeah, really interesting idea. And I think that from the perspective of the industry that I work in, having some kind of continuity around contact um, is just really helpful. And, and that's some of the stuff that we're trying to um, embed in, in, in terms of how our clients think about this. But that would be a, a really good angle for us in a way to engage um, in a different way um, uh, in, in, in some of the campaigns that we run. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and we will also have Michelle. Michelle, what were your ideas on it? Yeah, I think I really, really like that idea. And uh, some I, someone who's from a quote unquote WP background, I think I can see how this would be helpful, would have been helpful for me in, in my transition period um, going on to university. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Sherelle. And Tanya, what did you think of the winner? Yeah, I agree with Sherelle in the sense that I can reflect and think that would be really helpful for me. And I think in terms of kind of all the ideas presented today, there's so much value that can be added for um, young people. So regardless of kind of the winner or whatever, I think any implementation of any of these ideas would definitely help young people a lot. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. And lastly, we have Michael. Michael, what were your thoughts on our winner as well? Uh, well, great choice. <laughs> I thought it was, uh, yeah. It, I really enjoyed the, the debate and I think there's such a wide range of ideas from, if you look at Michael's idea, I'd put it at one end of the spectrum, which is more around a kind of really kind of quite tight focus intervention. But when we had ideas which went to kind of really deep um, kind of structural reforms. And I think the question that, the kind of subsequent debate really opened up for me is if we're all, it sounds like everyone on the, the call is uh, not particularly enamored with, with grades uh, in various ways as a kind of a, as a kind of um, mechanism for selection, then what could we kind of come out with which would be better than grades, but which would have enough kind of standardization and currency that people in the sector could understand it? Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you judges for your responses and your thoughts on the winner. Um, thank you everyone for participating and putting in your um, ideas. For everyone that's voted, we want to thank you. Um, special thanks to Helen and Sam obviously giving us a up, uh, update on the PG certs. Um, and thank you Helena for also joining us from Impetrus. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our festive finale. Um, it's been great seeing everyone. Um, I hope that it's been enjoy enjoyable and useful um, and that we're also able to take something away in order for us to be here next year and be able to say, we thought about this last year, we made it happen this year. <laughs> so thank you everyone again. Um, have a lovely afternoon and season's greetings.